Soviet coal coming out of tunnel entrances. We'd be, have to be very careful how we got onto the next level because if you put your head down and there was a, an enemy soldier down there, he would pike you through the throat with a steel pike and the length of that pike was longer than the trap door. So if you got piked, you couldn't pull your head back up again. If he went feet first, he'd pike you through the stomach so you couldn't get back up again. When the Australians first came, we didn't know their intentions. Our superiors gave the order to lure them out, to learn their way of combat. The second order was to attack them. Within minutes of entering the rubber plantation, contact is made with a small number of enemy. I fired a couple of rounds and knocked over a bloke, and of course confusion reigned supreme for the next three or four minutes. One of the three platoons pursue the fleeing Viet Cong, but they become isolated and are suddenly trapped by a large enemy force. And all of a sudden on our left side, all hell broke loose. And we got fired on by at least two machine guns, a number of rifles. There was that much noise. You couldn't hear, like you're yelling out to your mates of, they're okay. But the noise was that, that bad. <laughs> You could not move any more than three or four metres without attracting attention. As soon as you moved, Charlie saw you and started to bloody open up. The enemy fire, they, they were coming from the trees, from the ground. Bob Buick later reported, not very long into the battle, that uh, Gordon had been killed and that Bob had taken over command. Gordon Sharp got hit in the throat and died instantly. Uh, that dropped me in a big bucket of shit because all of a sudden I'm looking after this crew. There's no shoot and scoot today. The Australians are being attacked by a growing force of highly trained soldiers who already outnumber them by more than 10 to 1. In a rare move, artillery fire is called in from the Australian base. It's tricky and dangerous because these shells must fall with pinpoint accuracy from more than four kilometers away. This is an element that we had never expected. Artillery to, to us was something that we dropped in the rear of the enemy, hoping to catch them while they were running away from a, from a firefight. And here it was being used in an aggressive manner um, with visible results, and we could hear him on the phone saying, um, yes, I can see your fall of shot. Yes, you're in amongst them. Drop 50, move left 50, move right 100. Uh, he was directing artillery on to enemy. Between the pauses in gunfire, strains of Little Patty's concert drift to the battlefield. During the second show, I could sense that... Mm, Things were different, things were changing. I could see that um, officers were sort of being whisked away from the area. Suddenly you could hear these radio calls coming in and it was about this time the most vivid thing I remember was that Harry called, if you don't get help out to us soon, we're all gone and you'll go next. Ammunition is now dangerously low. And despite artillery support, the Australians are fighting for their lives. We all got holes in our shirts and our little bush hats. There were guys being hit. I was just talking to uh, Shorty, and I just asked Shorty, I said, um, you know, how, where's Doug? And he said, oh, Doug's dead. And that's when I saw Shorty um, get hit by a big burst of um, automatic fire. The men in the heat of the Battle of Long Tan were typical of Australian soldiers serving in Vietnam at that time. More than half were regular army, and the rest were national servicemen. Kill or be killed. And the threatened extension. 
conscription was always a controversial issue. It was originally intended to top up a sluggish response to army recruitment and because of concerns over Indonesia. Australian 20-year-olds were drawn at random to serve two years national service. People forget just how popular was the initial commitment to Vietnam. Huge support across the, right across the Australian community in 1965. It only started to go sour after we put conscripts in there and after the body bags started coming home with those conscripts in them. The visit by President Johnson near the end of 1966 boosted support for the war and was overwhelmingly popular at first. Following the Johnson demonstration, uh, I could say that I was leaning towards an anti-war position. My good friend uh, was constantly putting facts and figures before me, particularly things like bomb tonnages and the fact it was an undeclared war and uh, it, uh, that we hadn't declared war on Vietnam and that uh, it was a war of national liberation, which I hadn't come across before. So these kinds of arguments were gradually winning me over. but. My memory of things is that we were more interested in large abstract ideas like pacifism and freedom and so on, and the Vietnam War and the conscription issue were filters through which we, uh, we argued out these grander things. We were, after all, 17 and 18 years old, and uh, solving the world's problems is one of the things that one does at that age. Vietnam was the first war in our history that didn't enjoy widespread national support. And the protesters who were making their way to the streets were not those who normally insisted on a voice. When the, the, he heard about the conscription that he had to put his name in, he came to us and told us, he says, how'd you like the idea of me going to war? I said, oh no. I said, not now. He says, well, if my number comes out, he said, I'll have to go. He had many of his mates that told him what he could do to try and get out of it. But no, he said, I'm not a coward. He said, I won't do it. And then the time came then that he, his number had come out and he was called in. And he just come home and he says, Mum, that's it. I said, what's what? He says, I'm going away. I said, you're not. I said, where are you going? He said, to Vietnam. I said, where's Vietnam? I'd never heard of the place before. He says, oh, it's miles and miles away, he said. As far as the conscription was concerned, I, I didn't like the idea of it, but then again, I thought the boys need training. I thought they should train, but not to send them away. I don't think they should have been sent away. Not when they were so young, anyway. Kenny Gant was one of 17,000 conscripts destined for Vietnam. They earned a reputation equal to the Australian regular soldiers for endurance and courage. Were the National Service Man or regular? The duty that greeted most soldiers was patrolling, walking the weeds, questioning and constantly searching for the enemy, an enemy that could be easily hidden by a friendly smile. 